Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we have Dr. Diaz from the Montreal Neurological Hospital in Montreal, who's going to be giving us an overview of uh, various non-malignant brain tumors. But before we get into that, we want to encourage everyone who is listening to this um, webinar to um, sign up and register for our virtual brain tumor walks. As you know, we have pivoted just like everybody else in the world, and we are now uh, we've gone from hosting over 20 brain tumor walks in person to one virtual brain tumor walk this year. And we will be doing that on Saturday, June 27th. And we will all be walking together, or you can hop or skip or jump, whatever whatever you'd like to do. But we do encourage you to register as soon as possible and start fundraising. Funds are needed now more than ever to keep our programs running. And so we do encourage you, everyone to participate in what we're calling the 27 Canadians Challenge. So in honor of the 27 Canadians who will hear the words, you have a brain tumor, every day, ask 27, ask 27 friends to donate $10, or you can ask 10 friends to donate $27 to your brain tumor walk page. If you complete the challenge or raise an equivalent amount, we will send you a hashtag and brain tumors buff. And when you receive that bus, we would encourage you to wear it. However you want to wear it, Take a picture and share it with us on our socials at BrainTumorFDN. So let's see how many of us will be wearing our buffs on June 27th and follow our Facebook page for pictures and updates and inspirations. The funds you raise are more important than ever before, and we encourage you to please start fundraising now. We really can't do this without you. So thank you very much for everybody joining us today. Uh, we do have Dr. Diaz, who is a Canadian-trained neurosurgeon and brain tumor specialist. He graduated from the University of Toronto Medical School in 2007 and completed residency at the University of Calgary in 2015. He earned a PhD degree in 2013 from the University of Toronto for research performed under the supervision of Dr. James Retka at the Hospital for Sick Children Brain Tumor Research Center. After achieving certification in neurosurgery by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada in 2015, Dr. Diaz undertook fellowship training in surgical neuro-oncology at the University of Miami under the mentorship of Dr. Ricardo Camotar. During fellowship training, Dr. Diaz published the first series of meningiomas treated with laser thermal ablation at the University of Miami. Dr. Diaz is presently a neurosurgeon at the Montreal Neurological Hospital in Montreal and is an assistant professor of neurology and neurosurgery at McGill University. Thank you again today for joining us, Dr. Diaz, especially during these very, very busy times. I know we had planned to do this live on uh, on Wednesday this week, but we are pre-recording this so that we can make sure we get this information out to our community. So thank you again very much for joining us. And I'm going to switch you over as presenter now so we can see your screen. Perfect. And I see it. So whenever you're ready, Dr. Diaz, uh, I'll, I'll let you take over. Thank you, Janik, for this opportunity to present to the uh, Brain Tumor community. Uh, and thank you to the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada for the um, webinar series that they've uh, organized. Um, the topic that I uh, will speak about today is non-malignant uh, brain tumor. Um, and I'm a neurosurgeon at the Montreal Neurological Hospital uh, who specializes in, in brain tumor surgery. So the overview for my talk, uh, I have selected uh, five different diagnoses, um, which I'll review. Um, and I'm going to give a, a rather um, superficial look at, at these topics. Uh, but the, the point is to try to cover as many diagnoses as possible within this short period of time. Uh, so I'm sure there will be more questions uh, that come from, from my presentation, and I'm happy to answer those uh, by uh, email. Uh, and I believe the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada will provide uh, resources to um, answer those questions as they come up. Um, so I will, for each of these diagnoses, I will talk about the signs and symptoms, the diagnosis itself, other treatment options and new research that is uh, occurring right now uh, with regards to novel treatment approaches. So meningiomas are uh, extra-axial brain tumors. That means they arise uh, from outside the brain. They actually arise from the covering of the brain called the dura. Um, and they can be located uh, in any part of the, of the um, skull where, that is covered by dura. 
the um, typical signs uh, for meningiomas include headaches, uh, seizures, and focal neurological deficits. And these deficits could be weakness, numbness, imbalance, a visual deficit, or loss of smell. And the type of deficit that can arise from the tumor uh, relates to the location of the tumor. We see that uh, meningiomas are most common in women uh, and uh, typically in women in 30s to 50s. Uh, and as uh, you uh, see in this graph here, um, the older you get, the, the proportion of uh, meningiomas that occur in men increases. Um, so the ratio of male to female uh, actually decreases to closer to two to one from three to one um, as uh, the age progresses. Um, the uh, tumors, as I mentioned, um, can occur uh, anywhere along the, the skull base or even the convexities uh, of the brain. And uh, typically there are certain mutations that are associated with the location of the uh, tumor. And this is new knowledge that has come uh, about in the uh, recent uh, times uh, from investigations looking at uh, genetic sequencing of uh, series of meningiomas. Um, these are important uh, mutations to know about because uh, they may provide uh, new treatment options for patients uh, with these types of tumors. The diagnosis of meningioma is typically made uh, by uh, magnetic resonance imaging and then on tissue pathology. So the tumor tissue is examined under the microscope um, and the characteristic features of the meningioma are identified. Meningiomas can be divided into three grades, grade one, two, and three. Grade one uh, tumors are, have a very benign uh, course, whereas grades two and three tumors are more, um, what we term more aggressive um, uh, meningiomas, which means that they, they uh, tend to recur sooner and uh, grow more quickly. The first line treatment strategy for symptomatic meningiomas is uh, surgical resection um, by craniotomy. Uh, so this is open uh, surgery where the, the skull is opened and the tumor is removed uh, using the microscope. Um, other treatment options uh, include radiation uh, treatment. So for very small meningiomas, um, radiosurgery may be an option. Um, for larger meningiomas that have been previously treated uh, with surgery and that are in locations that um, preclude further surgical intervention, they may be treated with fractionated uh, stereotactic radiotherapy. In some cases when uh, tumors have been found in patients that have no symptoms and they, they've been found incidentally uh, due to uh, a CT scan that was done for um, other symptoms such as having had a fall, um, we may follow um, the patient over time uh, to determine if the tumor is growing and uh, make our decision about when to intervene surgically at the time when the tumor is, is growing or becoming symptomatic. There are two uh, important factors that determine outcome in meningioma. The first one is the extent of resection or how much tumor we remove at the time of first surgery. And you can see on this graph that the probability of the tumor coming back or recurrence uh, is much higher in a shorter period of time in those patients that have incomplete resection versus gross total resection. Uh, and in fact, at 10 years, we might see about 60% of the patients that had incomplete resection come back with growing tumor. Now, the second uh, factor that um, influences outcome is tumor grade. Uh, and this is the, I explained that there's three types of uh, grades of meningioma, grade one, two, and three. Uh, they, they're also called benign, atypical, and anaplastic. So grade one or the benign uh, tend to have the, the best uh, outcome. Um, the chance of recurrence is quite low, usually less than about 15%. Uh, over the lifespan of the patient if the tumor is completely removed uh, at first surgery. The atypical or grade two meningiomas and the anaplastic meningiomas uh, will 
occur at, in a shorter period of time. For the grade two meningiomas, on average, half of them occur at five years. And uh, for the anaplastic meningiomas, half of them occur at two years after surgical resection. There have been a number of reports of recent uh, advances in uh, meningioma treatment um, with uh, clinical uh, series as well as preclinical studies looking at targeted therapy with small molecule inhibitors of tyrosine kinase receptors. Uh, tyrosine kinase receptors are uh, molecules on the surface of cells that signal for um, all the factors that are required for growth of the cell. The um, three main signaling pathways involved in meningioma include the PIK3 AKT mTOR pathway, which is here, the MAP kinase pathway, and the hedgehog pathway. And these are path pathways that we know uh, can be uh, targeted with known small molecule inhibitors that are currently used for other types of uh, cancer. The um, goal of recent clinical trials is to determine whether these small molecule inhibitors have any effect in the clinic, and uh, these uh, studies are underway. For more information about specific um, clinical trials uh, using targeted therapy, uh, one may go to clinicaltrials.gov uh, and search under meningioma. In recent uh, years, the role for postoperative radiation therapy for intermediate and high-risk meningioma has also um, been highlighted. Um, typically, uh, the uh, treatment with uh, radiation for meningioma involves 54 to 60 gray of uh, dose, uh, which is given over 30 fractions or 30 days um, in small um, fragments of doses given each day. The um, in patients with uh, grade two meningiomas that are completely resected or who have recurrent grade one meningiomas, the three-year progression-free survival was found to be 93.8%. Uh, that means that uh, those patients that um, received radiation treatments after surgical resection um, for these grade, for grade two meningiomas that are, were completely resected um, very few of them had any recurrence at uh, three years, so less than uh, 7% did. Also, for patients uh, with incompletely resected grade two meningiomas or completely resected grade three meningiomas, the three year progression free survival was 58.8%. Um, and this is much better than what we see with uh, progression free survival for historical controls in which patients did not receive radiation treatment. So our current recommendation is that for intermediate and high-risk meningiomas, that uh, radi post-operative radiation be highly, uh, highly considered um, in order to reduce, to extend the progression-free survival uh, and reduce recurrence. There are currently, uh, there is currently a randomized control trial uh, comparing uh, observation versus post-operative radiation for patients with uh, WHO grade two. Uh, or three meningiomas, and we are awaiting the final results for that study. We will now speak about pituitary adenomas. Uh, so pituitary adenomas are tumors that arise from the anterior pituitary. Uh, you can see here that it's located at the base of the skull uh, in the cella turcica. Um, and these tumors uh, can expand into the uh, nasal uh, sinuses or uh, superiorly uh, into the intracranial space and press on the optic uh, nerves uh, and even extend into the third ventricle, uh, compressing the hypothalamus or posteriorly compressing the uh, brainstem. The typical symptoms uh, for pituitary adenomas can vary uh, widely depending on the type of pituitary adenoma. Um, so, um, very commonly, a uh, headache can occur, blurred vision given the compression of the optic uh, apparatus. Uh, loss of peripheral vision is a common finding. Fatigue and low energy uh, can occur, and this can be associated with weight gain or loss of libido. Um, uh, in women um, uh, uh, of reproductive age, the uh, loss of menstrual uh, periods can be an early sign of a pituitary 
uh, tumor formation, um, breast milk production or galactorrhea, hair loss, uh, skin changes such as easy bruising, uh, thinning of the skin or dryness of the skin, and changes in the uh, structure of the face, hands, or feet, such as growth of the fingers, uh, growth of the nose or uh, the jaw. Pituitary, adenoma, pituitary adenomas are um, more uh, commonly seen in uh, younger women uh, or older men. And you can see there's an inflection point around the age of 50 where the adenomas become um, more common in men over the age of 50 and less common in women. Um, the prevalence actually uh, in the population on autopsy studies is about 15%. So these are very common uh, benign uh, tumors. Um, and as you can see that in the majority of cases, they do not cause uh, any symptomatology and actually go un uh, undiagnosed throughout the person's uh, life. The diagnosis of pituitary adenoma is made with magnetic resonance imaging, uh, laboratory investigations, an endocrinological evaluation, and ophthalmological evaluation to assess the vision and the visual fields. Pituitary adenomas can be divided, divided into fu non-functional adenomas. These are adenomas that do not produce hormones or functional adenomas, which are adenomas that produce hormones. The adenomas that produce hormones can um, generate specific symptoms related to the type of hormone that is uh, produced. Prolactinomas are the most common, and those are tumors that produce prolactin uh, hormone. Um, prolactin is a hormone that's typically um, uh, formed uh, during pregnancy and actually can pr promote breast milk production in women. Growth hormone secreting adenomas are the second most common, and these result in a syndrome called acromegaly, in which uh, there is a growth uh, of uh, structures such as the face, uh, the hands, the feet, um, but as well uh, uh, issues with uh, hypertension, um, a joint uh, um, pain, um, back pain, and um, carpal tunnel syndrome can occur. Um, ACTH secreting adenomas um, are uh, produce the syndrome called Cushing's disease, um, and this uh, these are tumors that produce high levels of uh, ACTH, which is the hormone that stimulates secretion of cortisol. Cortisol uh, produces a lot of effects that are um, uh, that result in thinning of the skin, easy bruising. Um, weight gain, uh, increase in uh, blood pressure, uh, and effects on, on the heart, which can even result in, in heart uh, failure. Uh, TSH secreting adenomas are, are the fourth type, and these are quite rare um, uh, tumors that promote uh, thyroid hormone uh, secretion. Um, so I, as you can see, the, the pituitary adenomas uh, can be classified into a number of different types or subtypes of, of tumors, each with its own uh, clinical uh, features. Uh, treatment uh, really depends on the, the subtype of the adenoma uh, and the uh, clinical status of the patient. So things that we look at to decide on surgery are whether the tumor is growing, whether it's symptomatic, if it's causing compression of the optic chiasm uh, or other uh, structures in the uh, supracellular space, um, and whether the tumor is producing uh, hormones that are producing other clinical symptoms, such as growth hormone, ACTH, or TSH. In those tumors that are deemed uh, to be uh, surgical candidates, uh, surgery is, is quite effective. However, for functional adenomas, 15 to 40% of functional adenomas um, may fail surgery. That means that the, even this, despite surgery, uh, there's still tumor cells that are producing the uh, hormone uh, and may require, uh, these patients may require medical uh, treatment. Um, and I'll discuss about the medical uh, treatment options in the next slide. For prolactin hormone producing tumors or the prolactinomas, the primary uh, mode of uh, treatment is a medical 
um, sort of oral, oral medication that can suppress the uh, growth of these uh, tumors. But in about 10% of these patients, they will um, either not tolerate the medication or will fa fail um, to suppress tumor growth with the medication and they will uh, eventually require surgery. For patients with asymptomatic tumor that, that are small, usually less than a centimeter, and which show no, no, growth, no growth and no hormone production, these tumors are typically observed uh, in the clinic and not treated with medication or surgery. The new advances uh, in uh, recent times has been the pathological classification of pituitary adenomas, which changed in 2017 and is now based on the, on the differentiation of pituitary cells. The, this gives us a better understanding of the origins of pituitary tumors, and which is, in fact, uh, from stem cells that reside within the anterior pituitary gland. The four uh, tumors that are uh, recurrent uh, or malignant, um, recent work has revealed that temozolomide chemo chemotherapy can be quite effective uh, in offering an option for control of these tumors when surgery and other therapies uh, are not uh, no longer effective. Finally, uh, stereotactic radiosurgery, which is a, a large a single dose of radiation, um, uh, has uh, been shown to have a shorter time to treatment effect than conventional uh, fractionated radiation uh, in patients with Cushing's disease. And uh, the long-term uh, control rate at 10 years is quite good with 80% uh, control. The emerging therapies for adenomas uh, rely on uh, targeting specific, specific growth signaling pathways uh, that have been identified in each, each of these tumor types. Um, for prolactinoma, um, one of the recent examples of the patinib as a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Uh, at Comego uh, there has uh, been uh, at least three different uh, inhibitors that are currently uh, in clinical trials or have undergone early stage clinical trials. And for Cushing's disease, again, um, small molecule inhibitors of um, signaling pathways involved in tumor uh, proliferation as well as tumor growth have been, uh, have been used. These are uh, just examples of the, type of the types of uh, treatment that are emerging, um, and uh, we await for uh, more detailed studies on these. Um, however, it gives us a sense that um, there are some uh, novel therapies that are coming up uh, for the treatment of some of these more difficult to manage uh, adenomas. We'll next turn to craniopharyngioma. So craniopharyngiomas are uh, benign tumors that arise from remnants of, um, of the Rackeith's cleft, which is uh, embryonic uh, tissue uh, at the base of the skull. Um, typically, these tumors are located in the supracellar space, but they may extend in, into the uh, cella or where the pituitary resides, uh, or even higher up into the um, hypothalamus and third ventricle. The um, tumors typically have a nodular component as well as a cystic component, uh, and they're quite classically described on MRI. The main differential diagnosis here would be a, a pituitary adenoma in, in that location um, or other type of uh, optic pathway uh, tumor, such as an optic pathway glioma. The Typical symptoms include headache, blurred vision, loss of peripheral vision, which are, are symptoms that are very similar to pituitary adenomas. Um, however, additionally, these um, uh, tumors may produce excessive thirst and urination due to compression of the pituitary stalk uh, and lack of a normal production of uh, antidiuretic hormone um, by the posterior pituitary. The tumors may also result in fatigue and, and low energy. The distribution and age is bimodal, uh, with a peak occurring around the age of 5 to 10, and another peak occurring in the 60s to 70s uh, in older adults. The male to female incidence is uh, 1 to 1.
craniopharyngiomas are diagnosed by magnetic resonance imaging, uh, laboratory investigations to rule out, uh, rule out uh, hypernatremia, which is a high sodium, um, which is a result of a lack of antidiuretic hormone production, uh, endocrinological evaluation and ophthalmological evaluation, given the proximity to the pituitary stalk, the pituitary gland, as well as the optic apparatus. Treatment involves maximal surgical resection, radiation for residual tumor, and medical management of the uh, endocrinological dysfunction that occurs uh, from damage to the pituitary stalk, the hypothalamus, or the uh, pituitary itself. Uh, recent advances uh, have uh, demonstrated that uh, endoscopic uh, endonasal resection uh, can uh, be just as, as effective as open surgery uh, for these tumors. The endoscopic endonasal route is uh, the use of a camera through the nose um, and using normal um, sinus passages in the nose to uh, reach the, um, the skull base uh, where the skull base is, can be opened and access to more direct access to the um, to the tumor can be achieved. All types of craniopharyngiomas can be approached endoscopically. Uh, however, this is usually performed at uh, high volume centers where um, surgeons have uh, a good experience with endoscopic uh, techniques. Uh, and importantly, endoscopic surgery is not limited to adults. So there, there is an option uh, to use this in children at centers that have uh, experience. Uh, secondly, post-operative radiation is an important for the treatment of residual tumor. Uh, in fact, the 10-year local control rate was much higher with um, radiation after subtotal resection than with uh, observation alone. Um, this was 84% versus 52% uh, local control rate at 10 years. So, uh, in fact, the studies do show that um, if there is a residual tumor after attempts at uh, maximum resection uh, that uh, patients should be referred to for consideration of uh, radiation uh, therapy uh, to treat the residual tumor. Um, this uh, radiation, unfortunately, in, in children carries uh, um, a quite significant um, uh, side effects uh, and therefore the uh, consideration for uh, radiation treatment for children um, uh, uh, is quite important um, and uh, the treatment options, all the treatment options have to be considered uh, carefully um, as uh, the radiation can have quite significant side effects uh, as uh, children um, uh, get older. We next turn to vestibular schwannomas, also known as acoustic neuromas. Uh, so these are the nine tumors of the uh, vestibular cochlear uh, nerve uh, in the uh, angle of the pons and the cerebellum. Um, these tumors uh, typically grow, grow in this angle and have a cone uh, shape to them as they grow into the uh, canal in which the seventh and eighth cranial nerve travel. The typical signs and symptoms are hearing loss, tinnitus, which is a high-pitched uh, ringing sound, imbalance, vertigo, face weakness, face numbness, um, and in rare cases, headache and vomiting can occur with large uh, tumors. These tumors can be sporadic, uh, or occurring, that means occurring spontaneously or associated with neurofibromatosis type two, uh, which is a hereditary condition. The peak incidence is 45 to 64 years, and they're quite rare tumors occurring about six per one million persons per year. The male to female incidence is one to one. These tumors are diagnosed on magnetic resonance imaging and audiogram or uh, evaluation of hearing uh, is quite important as it will uh, determine the uh, treatment options available uh, to uh, patients. The uh, tumor, uh, can be uh, characterized based on size. Uh, and as tumors grow larger, they have uh, occupy more of the uh, space between the cerebellum and the brainstem and uh, produce more compression of the brainstem. 
The uh, treatment options for vestibular schwannomas include radial surgery uh, and uh, surgery. Surgery uh, can be divided into the surgery that is uh, hearing preserving and surgery that is hearing destructive in patients that have already lost uh, hearing. The um, most a common hearing preserving procedure is uh, retrosigmoid craniotomy, uh, and the more, most common hearing destructive procedure is a trans labyrinthine um, uh, craniotomy, which can also be combined with the retrosigmoid uh, craniotomy. The uh, factors influencing outcome for vestibular schwannoma includes the hearing status, and we talk about serviceable versus non serviceable hearing. So serviceable hearing would be a hearing that uh, can be preserved with a hearing aid. Um, the um, extent of facial nerve preservation is important. As I mentioned, the uh, tumor uh, is in close association with the seventh cranial nerve, which is the facial nerve. It's the nerve that controls motor function to the face. The um, goal of surgery is to preserve uh, facial nerve uh, function um, and uh, uh, auditory function as well. As the tumor size uh, increases, the risk of uh, hearing loss and facial nerve uh, function loss uh, increases as well. Uh, and so for larger size tumors, um, the consideration for uh, uh, preserving uh, these two critical functions um, has to be discussed with the uh, with the uh, surgeon uh, and strategies to uh, preserve uh, function of the uh, hearing as well as the facial nerve uh, should be employed. Patients may experience uh, post-operative uh, dizziness uh, or uh, nystagmus, which contribute to uh, difficulty walking or problems with balance. This vestibular dysfunction um, is uh, seen uh, after a vestibular schwannoma sh surgery. And there have been uh, recent advances that uh, suggest that preoperative uh, rehabilitation um, prior to surgery um, or even ablation of the vestibular function on the side of surgery uh, can actually improve postoperative uh, outcomes in patients. The uh, recent advances include uh, knowledge uh, regarding the risk of malignant transformation in vestibular schwannoma after SRS. This is in fact uh, quite a minimal uh, risk um, and uh, patients should know that the radial surgery for vestibular schwannoma is quite safe uh, and effective. Um, in fact, radial surgery um, after initial treatment with radial surgery uh, can be considered again uh, and uh, has been shown to be effective uh, even though they're even after progression uh, of the tumor after the first radio surgery. Some of the emerging strategies uh, that have come up recently um, include the use of uh, bevacizumab uh, or lapatinib uh, to reduce tumor size in NF2 patients with no surgical options. Um, these are two uh, small molecules that are involved uh, one, bevacizumab is involved in uh, inhibiting um, uh, vessel formation, um, and patinib is involved in uh, inhibiting uh, tumor growth directly by uh, blocking um, molecules on the surface of cells that are involved in signaling of uh, cell growth. Recent studies um, had suggested an, an association between uh, the cessation of tumor growth and the use of aspirin or other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs. Um, however, more, more recent studies um, with large number of patients have proven that um, these uh, medications actually do not prevent tumor growth in patients with vestibular schwannoma. Um, some recent studies that suggest the perioperative administration of a medication called nimodipine may improve facial nerve function outcomes. Uh, this is uh, still early in uh, clinical uh, trials, um, but for their experience with the use of nimodipine uh, would be quite in interesting to consider. Um, we do know that there is a good evidence for preoperative vestibular rehabilitation, which is uh, recommended 
the patients that are going to undergo vestibular schwannoma surgery, as well uh, a consideration for preoperative gentamicin ablation of the vestibular apparatus uh, should be considered. The way this uh, treatment works is that uh, gentamicin is injected into the tympanic membrane um, in, in three uh, intervals, approximately two months uh, prior to uh, surgery, and this uh, disables the, the uh, balance mechanism on, on the side of the surgery, allowing patients to recover uh, faster uh, their ability to um, ambulate without any uh, difficulties with their uh, balance uh, or disequilibrium after the surgery. Finally, uh, patients uh, uh, with chordoma. So this is chordomas are uh, exceedingly rare uh, tumors of the skull base. Um, they occur in about one per one million per year. The peak incidence is in the fourth decades for skull-based chordomas. Um, there are chordomas that can also occur in the spine as well as the sacrum. Um, but for uh, patients with skull-based tumors, um, the, these typically affect uh, patients in their 40s um, with a male to female uh, ratio of two to one. The typical symptoms are headache or neck pain, double vision, difficulty swallowing, hoarseness of the voice, face numbness or pain, and uh, face uh, weakness. The uh, location of the chordoma uh, is distributed in the skull base, and this is just a picture uh, from the top to bottom and from the side of the skull. And you can see the, the deep central location of these tumors. They're diagnosed by MRI, which uh, has a typical uh, characteristic uh, features of the tumor, uh, and then by uh, biopsy or resection. The treatment for these tumors is maximal safe resection. Uh, usually, there's an endoscopic approach that is used to reach these tumors, given the, the deep uh, location in the skull base. The um, role of postoperative radiation is quite important, um, as these tumors are, are highly resistant uh, to uh, chemotherapy in general. Uh, at the moment, there's no standard chemotherapy that is employed in these tumors. We know from rec uh, more recent studies that with a large number of uh, patients that the extent of resection is a good predictor of survival. Um, as you can see on this graph, those patients in blue that had gross total resection had the best survival probability um, at 100 months or 120 months uh, follow-ups. Whereas uh, those patients that only uh, had a partial resection uh, progressed quite rapidly with 50% of the patients having recurrent tumor around uh, 30 months. Also, postoperative radiation is important for prolonging local control. This is a, a survival graph showing um, the probability of survival in patients that underwent postoperative radiation versus those that didn't. And you can see that those patients that did not receive postoperative radiation had a, um, a, a reduction in survival probability uh, to about 50% at 12 months uh, compared to those that have radiation had survival beyond uh, 60 months. The uh, current clinical trials for chordoma are, are quite uh, varied. Um, they um, take advantage of uh, three different uh, strategies. One is to target um, receptors on the surface of cells that control growth, um, such as EGFR and other tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, the use of a particular molecule that is expressed by Chordoma to design vaccine therapies. Uh, so there's vaccine and immunotherapy that is being um, trialed at this point. And finally, uh, medication uh, used to inhibit uh, cell proliferation, such as palbosiclib and pemetraxed. 
in some rare tumors uh, with the loss of a particular molecule uh, called INI1, um, this uh, EZH2 inhibitor, tezimetostat, uh, can be also uh, tried. Um, again, these are all um, drugs that are in uh, early uh, clinical trials, either phase uh, one or two, uh, and more information uh, about these trials can be obtained either from clinicaltrials.gov or from the Cordoma Foundation uh, website, which has a, a well-curated um, list of clinic, current clinical trials that are uh, actively recruiting patients. And that is my last uh, slide. Uh, again, thank you uh, for uh, listening to the presentation. And uh, I will answer any questions that may come uh, from, arise from the presentation um, and uh, by uh, email. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Diaz. That was a very informative presentation for our community. And I know they will be uh, very thankful for it. So yeah, maybe you and I can connect about how we can field those questions, uh, whether it's by email or maybe everybody just sends me the emails directly and I can just do one document for you with all the questions on it. So you're not bombarded with, with too, too many emails, but uh, we can work that out between the two of us. So thank you so much for your time and your energy. And we know it's been very, very busy for you and your, your team at the hospital. And so we really appreciate everything that you've been doing and, and shifting and pivoting to help our brain tumor patients and our families uh, during this uh, pandemic. Um, and um, yeah, we just really appreciate your time. So thank you. You're welcome. So I'm just going to switch back over to my screen for a second before we shut everything down. And just um, just to let everybody know who is listening into this presentation that on Saturday, May 2nd, we'll be um, um, hosting a virtual brain tumor research symposium, which we're gonna have a variety of presentations highlighted um, and researchers. So you can register and that is a free event. Um, you can register on our website. We also have a new section on our website called hashtag support at home. So just because we're self-isolating doesn't mean we can't stay connected to the brain tumor community. So if you go to that particular page on our website, there's lots of really great uh, resources and virtual programming that we're doing. All of our support groups have gone to online. Uh, we have some educational programs. We're gonna have some community call-ins and also make sure you check out our socials on uh, Facebook and Instagram and so on. We have lots of posts there on different activities that we're encouraging people in the community to do. And also check back on that support at home page for the next community call in with myself, uh, Janik Goryeb, and also Todd, our, um, our one of our social workers on staff. And um, we're gonna be doing a live call in where you can just call in and get some support and ask us questions and uh, get some uh, resources from us. So once again, thank you so much, Dr. Diaz, for taking the time to be with us today and uh, sending you and your team a virtual hug and uh, be well, so chat soon.